Okay, so I don't really have any um, announcements for the class other than as just a reminder, uh, we have exam three tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the group with any uh, questions or anything that we want to talk about. Um, for lesson 11, I got a little confused in the activity with that's called Life Tables 2D. The last um, question is number four, and it says, which value equals the survivorship from age of two years to age of three years? So the answer, the correct answer, I guessed it, and it was 0 0.984, got that correct. I'm just trying to figure out how exactly to get there because I'm noticing that it is from ages one to two, that is the survival rate, but I don't see anything of that related to survivorship in the table. So yeah. I, I go ahead, sorry. I know that from birth to three years, it is 0.917, so I just look at what's in there, but I don't know how it, you, you go from with survivorship, you go from one age to another age. Yeah, so sometimes there's a couple of places in here where Cogbooks was, I think, a little sloppy and interchange survival rate and survivorship when they try to establish that survival rate is S of X and survivorship is L of X. So if, to get 0. 0.984, if they're asked, that should have said survival rate instead of survivorship. The important thing to know is survivorship is usually, if that's L of X, it's generally from zero to a certain time in the future. If it would have said from time zero to three, that would have been a more appropriate right way to write that. But it should have said equals survival rate from age two to three, because survive, survival rate is from one year to the next, from two to three, three to four, four to five, and so on like that. So numerically, you got it correct. But... Grammatically, I would say Cogbook should have written survival right there. Um, thank you. Um, so it goes from age two to three. So I would look at the column of two under survival rate. It's 0. Mm -hmm. 0.984. Or I guess where I'm also confused is should it be like in, it, it says it goes from two to three. So should I read what's in the age two column or what's in the age three column? Age two. So for survival rate, when it says two to three, always go with that's the survival rate of two year olds surviving to three year olds. So for the rate, it has to be uh, calculated for the two year olds. So it's always the lower number. If it's four to five year olds, look at survival rate for age four. If it's from one to two year olds, look at age one. Perfect. And and for survivorship, it's never like from one age to another. It's always from birth to whatever age there is in the future. Is that correct? Yes. And then you would look at it kind of the opposite, whatever age you end with. The only way it can get a little confusing if they ask, what is the survivorship from uh, birth to age one? But usually it would say for survivorship, it would use the term birth hopefully, in the, what Cogbooks has done mostly versus survival rate, it would say age zero to one. So that's that's kind of the way that they've been trying to distinguish it. But like I said, they were a little sloppy and they overlap the words a few times. But for the exam, survival rate will be S of X and survivorship will be L of X. So if they were to ask from birth to age one, it would just be whatever column is in zero, right? Yeah, and that's, is there anything unique about that column for that value? Um, The survivorship at age zero is one, and then the survivorship yep. at age one is 0.946. So the survivorship from birth to age one would be one. It's whatever is in the zero column, the birth yeah. column. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct what you said, but uh, this is kind of, it's related, but it's, a side note that I did want to make at some point, but we're kind of bringing the table up right now. 
So let me share my screen real quick so that I think that might help visually. Okay, so we see the table right here, right? Yep. From that activity. So this this box right here at age zero survivorship, it's a value of 1.0. Now these numbers are all kind of you know made up just for the sake of the activity, but is there any is this value here ever change in other activities or other exercises or in theory would that number ever change? Um, I don't think so. And why is that? Why is survivorship from birth always one? Because there's always going to be, um, I read that there was like, there's always going to be like organisms present at birth. So no matter what, it's whether or not you're either born or you're not born. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. They only count the births. So L, L of X or L, L of X at age zero is always go going to be one. Okay. So thinking, Matt, like later, if we think about how to calculate some missing values, that little remembering that piece of information could come in handy. Awesome. So you can always fill if you have a if you have a blank table, say on the exam, you can always fill in this box. L of X at age zero is always going to be one point zero. So it's an it's an like an unknown maybe that you'll be asked that we can actually know without doing the math. And then it'll help us do math further along the line if we have to solve for some of these other values. That sounds great. Thank you. Yep. Did that answer your question fully? Yep. Okay, cool. So then we can move to any other questions that anyone has. Since we're already talking about survivorship, um, can we talk about how to calculate that? Sure. So you're asking specifically how to calculate L of X? Yes. So there's a couple of different ways to do that. What is one of the formulas? Does anybody remember of a set? Because usually what you're going to get on the exam is you're going to get some type of uh, in some piece of information, much like these activities where they give you some of this information and they might ask you to solve for B of X. They might ask you to solve for L of X. Um, they might give you a table. There might be missing columns from the table that it gives you, it asks you in words to solve. So what's one of the equations that L of X is used in? Why don't we start there? L sub two equals L sub one, S sub one. Yeah, so that's that's using these two columns, right? To calculate, to solve for possibly uh, future values. Let me pull, let me see if I can find an example to make this a little clearer so we can go over. And there's also, here, this is, let me share my screen again. So one set of table you might get would have involved these three columns where you have L of X, B of X, and L X, B X, right? And it's asking you to solve, they might have a few of these filled in and a few of them missing and ask you to solve for L of X, B of X. How would we solve for this value or this column given these two uh, values. That'll be multiplication, right? Yeah, so we would just take L of X times B of X equals this column. So one times zero is zero, 0 0.5 times zero is zero, 0 0.25 times two is 0.5 and so on, right? But you might have these two columns and being asked to solve for L of X. How would we do it then? Put L of X times b of x over b of x and cancel out b of x. Yeah, so you just have to take that math, that multiplication equation and rearrange it to now be a division problem, right? So if you have these two, you can solve for l of x. If you have these two, you can solve for l of b of x. 
if you have L of X and L of X B of X, you can then solve for B of X. So that's different ways that you can use these uh, three variables to solve for one another. Let me, while we're on this, I did make some practice questions that are going to go right along with this. And why don't we, if we take a minute to maybe go over these as a group. Um, okay. Can everybody see the Excel spreadsheet here that I've opened? Yep. Okay. Let's say we have this question, and this is the information that we're given. This, this isn't a table. So if it asks us, what is the survivorship of an individual from birth to age of three years? What are we given uh, as far as data in this table? What do these stand for? S of X would be survivor rate, and B of yep. X would be fecundity. Yep, so we're given fecundity as B of X. We're given survival rate as S of X, and we're given age categories, right? So age zero, one, two, and three, and then these values. What is survivorship asking for? What What is the variable of survivorship? L of X. Yeah, and we're not given L of X, right? So we'd have to add a new column, right? We have this blank co column, and it's asking us, Maybe let's just work on filling it all in first, and then we can go back. So we know we have to go to three years, so we have to go all the way to the bottom, so we do have to solve for all of them. So how do, given this set of information, how do we solve for L of X? So we'll start with the concept that you just mentioned, which is the first one is going to be one, right? Yep, exactly. Oh, shoot, I scrolled too fast. Sorry, I got excited. Uh, yeah, so if we click here, we know that we can enter the value of 1.0, right? So we know that we have the first value. How do we solve for L sub L of X uh, two? Multiply um, L of one. Oh wait, sorry. multiply um, L of zero times um, S of zero. Yes, so this equation right here, right? They, and our thing I do wanna make a note about too is the way Cogbooks writes it, it's a little confusing. S sub one and L sub one is associated with age zero, I think, right? So it's just knowing which ones are associated with each other is important, but this is, you're exactly right. This is the equation that we would use here. So we have S of one and L of one. If we multiply those two together, we can get L two, right? Or L of two, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so we, we, we have that value given to us. We knew that this is gonna be one, right? So we multiply this by this, we can get this. And we do the same thing where we then now have this value. So we multiply, S of two by L sub L uh, two, and we can get this value, right? So that we can fill it in and get survivorship all the way down to uh, three years, age three is 0 0.27. Does that make sense how we got, uh, how we filled this column in and we got to the final answer? Yes. Okay, does anybody else have any questions about the math on this? Okay, what if this was a multi-part question then? And then we said, what is the net reproductive rate? Do you remember how we solve for that? That's the sum of LX uh, times BX, right? Yep. Yeah, so we have BX and we have LX, we would need to make yet another column, right? The LX BX column. And we can do that, it's pretty simple math, right? So we have zero times one is zero, 
1 times 0.85 is 0.85. 3 times 0.48, we may need a calculator for that one, 1.42, but and so on. And then what we do is we just, as you said, take the sum of this column and we get 3.19 is our row or our net reproductive rate. So exactly right. And this is just the mindset I wanted to show. So we're given some data. We need to have, we have missing columns. We need to recognize what they are and then how to fill them in using the data that we're given. And then the last part of this question is based on the value of row. Do we expect this population to increase and, or decrease and why? It would increase because um, they're creating three rather than just two. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because what does row tell us? It tells us that this on average, a given female in the population is going to produce 3.19. So over about three individuals. So they're more than replacing themselves for every female. So that would lead to a growth in population. Exactly. All right, are there any questions about how we uh, filled in this table or about row at all? Okay, if not, I'm gonna move on to a second uh, question that's kind of similar. So this one says, which value equals the annual survival rate of four-year-olds? And they give us age, L of X, B of X and L of X times B of X, right? So we're given these columns, but it asks for survival rate. Is that one of these columns or is it missing? It's missing. Yeah, right? So we know that they're asking for S of X, right? Because that's survival rate. How do we solve for S of X now, given this information? Do we know what the value is for S of X at age zero? Point six because it's the net the uh, survivorship at one divided by one. Well, it's, fair enough. No, we can mathematically solve for it, but I just meant like with L of X, we know that this value is always going to equal one no matter what, right? Is there an equivalent value for S of X that we would know? zero it they but it's not meant to be a real trick question but the answer is no we it could be different numbers it's not a constant like uh, l of x at zero is one so this s of x could be it could vary depending on what other variables there are in the equation so we can't just fill it in for s of x but there is an equation we can use um to calculate it at zero Right, we go back to use the same equation. So we use L, to, L of two equals S1 times L1, right? And we have L2 and L1 values. So we can use these two values to calculate the S, uh, S of X at one or age zero, right? Or S of one. And what that looks like, it's a little different, right? So we have the equation here, right, L2 equals S1, L1. And we know that L2 is 0.6, S1 is unknown, so we leave it as S1, but it's S1 times one. So again, like we talked about before, we just have to rearrange it a little bit. We divide 0 0.6 by one to solve for S1, and that just equals 0 0.6. So I think that's what somebody said earlier. So mathematically, yes, they're correct, um, but that's how we go about solving it mathematically. And now that we have, um, this value, we can solve uh, the next line, right? Because we have L3 and L2, but we're missing S2. So what we do is we have 0.56 L3 uh, equals S2, the unknown, times L1, 0.6. If we rearrange it again to divide 0.56 by 0.6, we can solve for S2 to be uh, 0 0.9. And we can solve, do it the same way for all of the values here. And then we fill in the table, so we can't go that past zero. 
But then we look back at the actual question. So it says, which value equals the annual survival rate of four-year-olds? So we have the answer up there. Uh, what is what is it uh, for four-year-olds? 0.5. Yeah, right? So we don't even have to go all the way to the end of five where they die off. We go to four-year-olds and it's 0 0.5. So this one, again, it's knowing which column is missing, how to solve that column, and then after filling in the column, how, which data point to pull out to answer the actual question. So are there any questions regarding to how we got uh, this column filled out and how we calculated um, the missing values here? Um, so I'm a little confused about like um, how your how the equations are written. So it correlates to the age, right? Not like because age zero is age zero, right? Or is it age, age one? Age zero, this is this your uh, newborns. So we call them age zero because they're less than one year old. And this is when they get to one year old. It, and it, again, it, it doesn't have to be years. It could be months. It could be weeks. Um, but yes, this is for the sake of this example, let's say it's, eight, it's years. This is newborns up less than one year. And this is one year olds less than two years old. And this is when they hit two year olds. This is when they hit three, four, five, and so on. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Cool. All right, are there any other questions about this or the previous equation? Because these examples, I will say, are gonna be important to understand mathematically how to do them for the exam, as well as conceptually how to answer questions about them for the exam. Okay, cool. If not, we can move on to uh, any other questions that anybody has. For the activity um, using a matrix model in T12, I had to go through all the extra videos because I really struggled to, to figure out how to solve those. And what you just said, um, like I think I can connect the math because I can see patterns, but I couldn't explain any of that conceptually um, on the exam if needed. So could you talk about maybe matrices a little bit and what actually the math is doing? Sure, let me see, let me go to my notes real quick. I think there's an example in how I, yeah, so I think this might be uh, a helpful way to walk through it. Okay. So I think this is one of the activities, everybody can see the matrix models in my Word document, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this would be an example of a table that you were given. And I think, and it also gave you all of the N sub zero equals 122 all the way through N five equals six. And I don't have it in the notes here, but that would be additional information you're given. And if it gives you n sub zero, that is right here in this column. And why does it go in this column at t and not at this column at t plus one? So let's yeah, think conceptually a little bit in our first step. What's the difference between t and t plus one? Can you think of it like t initial and then t the following year? Yeah, that would that would be one way to think about it. That's correct. Another way I like to think about it is it could be T initial, that's one good way to put it, or it could be T current. So that's the current time that we're in or the initial time that this problem started or the question started, so either way. And then what is T plus one again? Like the, the next um, time period? Yeah, exactly. So that's the current time plus one. What, whether that's a year, a month, or a week isn't super important, but we know that, as you said, that's T plus the next time period. And T plus two would be the next, the second, you know, T plus one, and then the following time period. T plus three would be the time period after that, T plus four, and so on. T 
plus four would just be four times after the initial time period, whether that's four years or four months, again, is not super relevant, but it's just four times whatever time unit we're using. So again, this is what we're given. Um, what are the numbers in the table? The numbers on the top are the fecundity and the diagonal numbers are the survival rates. Yeah, what is fecundity again related to? Birth rate. Yeah, so these are gonna be the birth rates and these are gonna be the survival rates. And what are the birth rates and survival rates of? Females? Or... I mean, the birth rates, yeah, those are gonna be related to the females in some sense, but is it only concerned with the female survival rate? It's concerned it's with the whole pop, but go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, it's, it's gonna concerned say with the option. whole population. Sorry. <laughs> so it kind of, it lumps the males and females together and it just thinks of it as a population level, right? And we know that biologically, you know, the females are the ones giving birth to the offspring, but as a, as a population, the population is also giving birth as a whole too. So it does think of it in terms of uh, the population. So this is the birth rate of the population and the survival rate of the population. But why do we have different numbers um, and not all one survival rate and all one birth rate? Because of differences in age? Yeah, because this is matrix tables are concerned with age-specific survival rates and age-specific birth rates. And why do why do we have two zeros here um, at the you know on the left and positive values to the right because age zero is and age one are not having any babies exactly age is zero and age is one are not re at reproductive age so their birth rates are zero they don't contribute to any births in the population but they do survive at a 94 98 percent survival rate right so they move on to ages uh, three, four, five, and six, where they do start actually reproducing and contributing to the population. And we see even here at the higher age, they're contributing to more than one individual. So that's why the population can sustain and potentially grow, even though all these age classes down here are essentially not contributing in a positive manner to the uh, population. So 0.9 is pretty much neutral. So it's right about replacing itself. And at this age, they're more than replacing themselves keeping the population persistent. All right, so conceptually, I think that takes care of, you know, everything we're given in this, well, actually on the column, what do these numbers mean? There's one more piece of information. So this is this column right here, n sub zero, n sub one, n sub two, and to five have numerical values. And what are these numerical values? What is n? That's how many individuals are alive at in that age group. Yeah, exactly. So n is this the number of individuals alive, and sub zero would be the number alive at you know newborns. So there's 122 newborns in that population. There's 101 one year olds. So there's 35 two year olds, 26 three year olds, 14 four year olds, and six five year olds. So now I think that covers everything in this table. Um, are there any, any other questions or something not clear in this table yet for anybody? Okay, so then what I would do when given kind of this matrix table is after we understand what, you know, what the basics are and we put in the populations, we eventually want to put in this population, but there's going to be some math there. So what I like to do is I like to create a life table from the matrix table, right? So now we have our ages, so n sub zero, that's information that we were given. And what we could even do is we can say at time t, t sub zero, or just t, uh, the total population is 304 if we add up everything together. So we know the population in the initial year is 304 individuals. We have all the birth rates by age that we can line up. We have the survival rates uh, by age that we can line up. 
We can even put in these two zeros right here because we, we've already talked about it, but why do we know that at age zero and age one, there's no new babies? Because they're not developed to uh, be able to reproduce. Yes, I would agree. Biologically, that's why we know, but what I was kind of getting at is mathematically, their birth rate, B of X, fecundity is zero, right? So we know that that is automatically, they can't produce anything. So we can fill those in. But we'd have to do some math to fill these in and to fill these in, right? How do we calculate the number of new offspring or the number of new babies based on the information that we're given? For this, we would need to multiply each age class, the amount in each age class, by its birth rate. Um, but yep. I did want to ask you, previously in the cogbooks, I think there might be a typo, because it shows that we would calculate each birth class by B of zero, which is not how that you works in every other example. You would do it for the first row. So you would do N of zero times B of zero, and that's how we get this zero. And then you would do N of one times B of one, and it still would be zero for this. But then now that we'd get positive values for N of two, 35 times 0.2 for this value. Can you recall where in Cogbooks that was by chance? It's it under, it's oh, under T12, the sub, uh, title using a matrix model to predict population growth. Uh, let me see if I. D12. Modeling age structured populations, that one. Okay. And then scroll down to using a matrix model to predict population growth. And it's the first big long formula. All, every uh, one of them is D0. Yeah, let me. Let me share that screen. I believe that that is a typo. That's a good catch. I spent so long trying to figure out what that formula even was. Yeah, wow. I missed that totally. That's a, yeah, because like I said, N of, well, this is just for, no, that shouldn't be, that's N of zero should be, Yeah, so you want the number of newborns in the current year. Everything times B of zero would be zero. Yeah, no, it's using 30 times. Yeah, no, it's a typo because these B of zero, it should be B of zero, B of one, B of two, B of three, B of four. Yeah, that's definitely a typo. Okay, that was the only part that I was really struggling with. Um, yeah, so no, that that's very mis sense. misleading. That makes sense. Yeah, so let's get off of that screen and go to my my example that doesn't include that typo. <laughs> Maybe this will make a little more sense. Okay. So we're back on seeing the Word document? Yes. Okay, so we talked about this, and now what we want to do is fill it all in, right? So this is, I think where the typo was, this is like, it's vertical here, but they wrote it out horizontally, right? Um, this is how you would find the new babies. You would take N of X times B of X and multiply these two uh, columns together, these two rows right here and the, these two different columns. And you would get zero and zero as we said for the first one. And then you would get actual values for the next one. And that's this what this means conceptually is that this is, you know, newborns are producing zero offspring, one-year-olds are producing zero offspring, two-year-olds are producing seven, three-year-olds 10.4 or 10. And we can, what we can do is we can add these all up and then we can say at what the total new offspring produced at T0 is 39.6, or if we round it to a whole offspring, it would be 40, right? And then if we wanted survival of adults, what we would do is something similar. We would take the, a number of existing adults 
for that age category. So 122 n of zero, but now we would multiply it by the survival rate. And that's what we were given here, the S of X. So 122 times 0.946 is 115. And what that means is from T to T plus one, this is how many uh, survived to that T plus one. So out of the newborns of the, that year, 115 survived to be one-year-olds the following year. And the same thing we can calculate for this, and we can get out of the 304 that we started with at T0, the following year, we'll have 283 total survive. But we know that we also had 40, so we can add those together and know that population in year one was, or T0, was 304, but then the following year at T plus one, 283 plus 40 is 323. Right, So the population grew from the first year, T0, to T plus 1. And then I'm not sure if uh, everybody's had a chance. Um, I would recommend watching this uh, YouTube video. The person does a really good job of breaking this table down. That's where I got the ideas from. But it uh, does it a little bit more math, and it's just another kind of way to see it. Um, I posted that in one of the announcements, so the link can be found there too. All right, so then why don't we go ask some questions about this? And this is from, I think this is from one of the activities. So having that table, we can ask, if I ask the question, how many three-year-olds would you expect in the population at T plus one? Looking at this table, how many three-year-olds at T plus one? Would you multiply the number of two-year-olds by the survival rate of the three-year-olds? Yes, exactly, right? So we have N2 times S2 is 35 times 0.98. And that'd be 34.44, or if we round it for whole organisms, it would be 34. What are the next question ask is how many newborns uh, would you expect in the population at T plus one? So how did we solve this? If we had this table, this is we're calculating new babies, right? So we have all these numbers here. Which number is the total um, new babies for the, the next year at T plus one? The sum of that column. Yeah, exactly, right? And that would be this value at 40, right? Because we'd have to calculate for each age bracket for the previous year, right? So we have this would be zero, zero. And then these all have some offspring, but it's the total newborns at T plus one, that would be 40. Yeah, so that's just how many new total babies equals the sum of new babies from each age class. From the table, we can see that it's 40. All right, so how about number three then? How many of the newborns expected at time T plus one would be produced by individuals that are three years old at time t. It's kind of a mouthful. So we know that three-year-olds at time t and asking about their newborns. So we know that this is time t in this table. So three-year-olds at time t would be this column. Then well, how many offspring would they have produced? That'll be the 10.4, right? Yeah. So another way to word it would be how many babies were made by the original three-year-olds. I think that's a little 
simpler way of stating that question. So exactly right. You have you take your total number of three year olds and multiply it by their birth rate. Twenty six times point four is ten point four. Or if we round it to a whole organism, right? We have ten. Does that make sense a little bit more on how to use the matrix tables and what information we can kind of get from them? Are there other questions? Anything not quite so clear yet? So I know a lot of the activities didn't show how to like build the missing tables as well. So that's why I wanted to go through some visuals with you because for the exam, do keep in mind, like sometimes when you get asked a question, like, you know, what value represents survival rate at age four, if they give you the S of X column, you have the value right there. But if they don't, it might be asking about a value from a missing column. So you might have to do multiple calculations, even if it is just a multiple choice question. Um, but this kind of a practice was how to build those missing columns from the tables and what, um, how to use the equations to kind of fill them in and a little bit of conceptually what those values mean. All right. There's a question in the chat, but real quick before I forget, I did get a couple emails about this. I want to point this out because this was another kind of, let's say, half typo in Cogbooks. It was just a sloppy way that they put tables together. So you remember seeing this, these life tables where you just had to fill in the numbers. So what the I believe what happened here is the columns for L of X, B of X, and L of X, B of X those go together, and if we just focus on those, everything's okay. But if we try to use some of the other equations, like in using S of X, then the math is actually not going to be correct. So I think what the, the creators of this particular page did is they just focused on these last three columns, and that works out mathematically. But if you try to use S of X, which is an appropriate method, you're going to run into some issues, which some students have already pointed out. So this does, like I said, considering the S of X columns, there's typos. But if we just focus on the L of X, B of X, and L X, B X, then it works out. And I think the the creators just didn't, they just kind of made through numbers in these some of these S of X columns. All right. And then there was a question in the chat. So there's a question about modeling delayed density dependence and the logistic growth model with time of delay equation. Okay, yeah, so was there was a... My, um, so um, if you could please uh, go to uh, topic 10 on Cosmos. Sure, and that's, is it it's a modeling delayed dependent or density dependence? Uh, yeah. Uh, specifically to the example found under the um, example with the flick width. Okay. Um, so they were trying to show us how um, that population of plants was uh, growing over time. And they were doing that to show us how the equation for the logistic growth model with time delay works. But when they were doing that, they didn't, like in the, in the equation, um, it doesn't um, show the population size at um, the Greek letter T time units in the past. They just put a one instead of like the N subscript T minus the Greek letter T, you know what I mean? I believe so, but let me share it so that we can agree. So you're talking for this equation right here, you're talking about this right here. Uh, let me see. Because this I, is just the one is what you're talking about. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't like on the N1 over K, uh, it doesn't show the N subscript T minus the Greek letter T. 
so I'm confused because then they said, well, you can. Um, so this is what you're that, talking right here, right? Yes, exactly. Like, okay. They didn't use that. And so I'm confused. Um, so I think what they did is they just simplified it. So I'm trying. Because they said for, they said um, there were 10 plants uh, per square meter in year one. So mm -hmm. they put the 10 for N sub kid one. Right? Yep, because that's population like, at time one is 10. Yep. Exactly. So then, but then um, they didn't take into consideration the subgroup T minus the Greek letter. So that's what I'm like, why are they doing that? Yeah, so my guess is what they did is they just oversimplified the example. They could have added that letter and given you a different value for that you would have to calculate on the top each time. It would have been N minus whatever that value is. And they just mm -hmm. chose to make the Greek letter zero. So it's not the best example. Um, uh, um, because I'm it's not the best delay. example for delay density dependence. It's a good example for growth rate. I see. Okay. Um, because I don't know, maybe in the exam, like we have to do calculations. And um, when I did the calculations uh, on my calculator, uh, like I still get 20 uh, when I both um, use Roundup and when I do not. So I just don't know how picky the professor is going to be when seeing those answers. You know what I mean? Like, a 20.02 compared to a 19.8. So if it's multiple choice and it comes, the answers are not going to be that close together where if you, they're not going to be like 0.5 difference, they will be at least a couple whole numbers away from each other to give space for rounding errors or rounding differences. Because I agree, depending on which calculator you use, you might get a different rounding answer. So they're set up that if you're close, like within one, you'll be able to figure out what the answer is. And if it's for the short answer, um, I just recommend there, show your work. And if I can follow your work or the TAs that are grading the short answer can follow your work and it's it's close and it just looks like a rounding error, you will get full credit for that. Okay. So the hard part will be if you don't show your work and you're off by like two, then we're not gonna know why you're off by two and you know, that would be far enough away that it's not a rounding error. It's not within one that that could be grounds for losing some points. So the safest oh, okay. bet is just to show, show your work where you can on the exam. Okay. Awesome. That was just um, all I was confused about. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And it does give us here the, the T or Greek letter here equals one. So I found that. And if we go back to the actual equation where they use it, what does putting a value of that would be zero. Well, that would be, that. It's 10, but it's zero oh, minus yeah. or time one minus one. Um, yeah, I don't know why they didn't. That's a good question. I don't fully know why at this moment. I'll have to go back and look at it a little closer. Why they gave you a good example here of modeling delayed de density dependence. Mm -hmm. And then when they go to do it, I could see them putting it in and if it just negates itself because it's zero or one, it would disappear, but it doesn't even show it as an option. So exactly. yeah, I can get back to you through an email on this uh, question after I look at it a little closer, but. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I can just uh, write my email in the chat and um, we can move on with the other questions, I guess. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so 
Um, anybody have any other specific questions or anything they want to go over? Um, I had a question on number 11 in the learning objectives. Sure. Um, it said, describe when the net reproductive rate reflects the geometric growth of an age-structured population. Is that just like being able to identify the different shapes of the age structure graphs? That has to do with identifying the shapes, but also what's kind of unique about geometric growth compared to some of the other models, because the ones that it would be compared to here would be like exponential. They look similar, but how can you tell an ex exponential from geometric growth? Well, geometric growth takes into effect or takes into account that they have distinct breeding periods. Yeah. So if we think of exactly, that's what I was looking for, that they have dis distinct um, reproductive or breeding periods or birth periods. Um, so it says, so the net reproductive rate is rho, right? So when that reflects the geometric growth of an age-structured population. So if it's age-structured, that would be like when we're looking at age zero, age one, age two, age three. So at individual age um, ages, if we just want to call it. So how could geometric growth that has set reproductive times match an age-structured population? That's, I think, what the question's getting at. Okay. The only thing that I can like recall at the top of my head of the age structured graphs is that some were like diamond shapes, so they were more narrow at the bottom, meaning there were less young people born in the generation. Okay, those that's the shapes that you're thinking about. Um, I guess I'm not thinking about the shapes as much. I retract what I said previously now that I've read it again. So what it's getting at is when birth rates are annual to match the age structure of the population in the geometric growth model. When the model uh, birth rates match the age structure like differences. So if it's an annual um, age structure where you have z newborns, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and if the geometric growth model can be used for that when it provides birth at a single annual um, one year that matches the difference in the age structure of that model or um, the age structure population. Alternatively, it could be the geometric growth model matches it when, the, say, those age structures are six month intervals, right? And then the reproduction is every six months. And they could be the same as if it's every two years in that age structure population. And then the geometric growth model, the population reproduces every two years. So when they match, that um, we use the word annual a lot with geometric, but whenever that um, interval is, maybe that's a better word for it. Does that make sense? So when the interval from yeah. the geometric growth model matches the differences in the age structures, that's a long way to get to the answer. Sorry, <laughs> does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Because if so your geometric growth, equation, sorry, go ahead. It's fine. When you're looking at the geometric growth equation, would you have to expect that the time values would be like one, two, three, just like the age structures? Yes, exactly. The okay. time values would have to match the age structure. Thank you for So just as an example, <laughs> if the geometric model said like N2, but the age structure had like and 2.5, that's not necessarily something that would match, so we wouldn't use that. Yeah, it would not reflect each other equally. Yeah. Okay. It would not be, well, a, the you. geometric growth model would not be a good fit to describe that age structure. You could maybe use a different model for that then.
So if we're speaking about those models, I'll build on that a little bit. So there were some activities that ask about some questions, like conceptual questions about the models. I'm talking about the exponential, like geometric, uh, logistic, and even the matrix models. So they, knowing what the assumption of those models is going to be important for the exam. So what's one assumption about the, I guess, uh, exponential model that is different than the logistic growth growth model? So the exponential assumes continuous births and deaths with time. Um, I would agree. I guess I don't know what the logic you're asking about the compared to the logistic growth model, right? Yeah. Does the logistic growth model also follow the statement you made that there are continuous mm -hmm. births over time? So the population would theoretically continue to grow forever. Uh, no, because it accounts for carrying capacity. Yeah. So to answer that, then what I'm getting at is the exponential model assumes no carrying capacity and the logistic growth model assumes there's a carrying capacity. So that, that's how one of their assumptions differ about carrying capacity. That was just an example of a type of question is what I was getting at. You could get asked from comparing the models. So knowing what the assumptions of all those models are and you know maybe when you would use one versus the other and why, um, would be important. So I guess maybe to go back and build on that question. So we know that one assumes a carrying capacity, uh, the logistic growth and the exponential does not assume a carrying capacity. Why does the logistic assume a carrying capacity? Why is that variable added? I guess, why do populations have carrying capacities that we can calculate? Because that's what you see and happens in nature, I guess. I agree. <laughs> what... Why do carrying capacities exist? Why why can't populations just grow to infinite size or numbers? There's limiting resources. Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm getting at, right? There's limited resources, and those are examples would be, you know, there's limited food, there's limited space, uh, so it can't sustain. And if we overshoot the population, what happens then? Or we overshoot the population out. carrying capacity. Yeah, so we go over the carrying capacity, for a little while, we can overshoot it, but if we do that and there's not more resources introduced to that environment, the population will start to die off because there won't be enough resources to support that high level of population. And then it typically goes under carrying capacity. Um, and why do we see some populations have, you know, they either are smooth and they go right up to their carrying capacity and they're stable, and some populations go up and then they oscillate over and under, over and under repeatedly. So why do we see that difference between populations sometimes? Isn't that isn't that largely due to the delayed density dependence? Exactly. What could be what could be maybe an example of delayed density dependence? So like if there's more prey, um, it's going to take some time for the predators to get more numbers based off of the more prey yeah and predators aren't reproducing necessarily every day right a lot of species have annual reproduction so if they eat really have say there's a high prey population they eat really heavily on it the females are in really good condition they have an abundant amount of resource or offspring rather and then those offspring are born and they have to feed them but that resource slowly gets depleted and then there's going to be a, a delayed die-off so it's like when good times you'll know, make for a lot of energy and a lot of resources, you can expand your population or grow your population. 
but there's going to be that lag effect with the delay density dependence that later in the future, that population is going to be too large and the resources are going to be depleted and it's going to just take time for that population to die off. So that's this is the lag effect of resources. If we could go back to the differences between the exponential and the logistic models momentarily. Um, sure. There is a question and I think it's the second activity in T9 that I um, have a bit of a problem with. Um, it's number six in the second activity in T9. All right, let me get to it so I can see it. So activity two. Is it two you said? I believe question. so. It's not the chart, but the questions, and it's question number uh, six. I think I know. Yes, this says which model describes a population that never grows exponentially. Is that the question? Yes. Which... This is, I would argue, a slight error by Cogbooks because I don't like their wording. Okay. Go ahead and explain why you don't like it. Well, because previously in the in the Cogbooks like chart where it shows the logistic growth model, it actually says early growth is exponential. Yep, you're exactly right. Yeah, this is yeah, this is an error in Cogbooks that I see that did not change from the last time I taught this, which is interesting, but let's talk about it. Yeah. So I would argue the better way to put it is to say, like you said, early growth is exponential. So the question could be better asked to say which um, or which model never continuously grows exponentially. Okay, I just want to make sure that a question like that wasn't like going to be on the exam or something. If it is, you'd get full credit for that explanation and probably everybody else too, because that would be an error on the exam's part. Um, so okay. yeah, I would think that this is a poorly written question by Cogwix because they do have that example where they show you early growth is exponential and then it has that S curve where it goes from exponential and goes the opposite way then. Uh, to go under its carrying capacity as it, it uh, population growth declines as it approaches carrying capacity. So, no, oh, very good point. Glad you brought that up. Unfortunate to see it's not changed. So maybe we can talk about this a little bit too, could cover some more of the assumptions. So if we go up to number three, it says, which models assume that individuals in the population are identical? And the models it's talking about are exponential and logistic growth. So which of those two models assumes that individuals in the population are identical and why? They both do because they don't account for individual variations. Yeah, so that one is kind of borderline a trick question, but it's just to make us think, you know, yeah, both models. And as you said, because it, neither model assumes anything age categories, like, right, we're not building life tables with logistic or with, uh, well, with logistic or exponential growth. So age structure doesn't matter. The matrix models are beyond that. Yeah, so they don't consider differences between individuals. So they don't consider, you know, offspring by age class or anything like that. Both essentially just assume that all members of the population have the same chances of surviving and reproducing each year. So that's why these are in the beginning and they were introduced kind of as useful, but maybe overly simplistic models. Am I missing something mathematically? Because for from Cogbooks for the logistic growth model, I had written out written down 
Rn times one minus N over K. And then in activity one, where you're just matching up um, equations and it's got Rn times K minus N over K instead of the one minus N over K. I'm just wondering if I'm missing something in my notes for the equation. Are you talking? So it's an activity one in T9, the one we're in right now. Yeah, so this one right here, and you're talking about this equation up here? Yeah, yeah. And you're saying thought... on, the, on the inside of the bracket, there should be a one minus? And right, then I thought be... it was one minus N over K. Yeah, that's wrong because that has K minus N over K. I need to, yeah. I'm going to make some notes on these because this is another typo. No, okay. you're, you are absolutely so, correct. This is Okay, wrong. so both of those, because there's, there is, there again, too, where it's just got the R times K minus N over K. And this one, too, here you're saying? Yeah. Is that also a typo or? Uh, yeah, that should be an N on the outside. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's both wrong. According okay. to my notes as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just I, should, I, kind of, I would looked through all the reading to try and find that equation or try and make it make sense mathematically, and I wasn't able to find it or make it make sense. So on this page or in general, the logistic just in general, order? I was just trying to figure out what I was missing there because I knew it just doesn't match the one we were given in the yeah. card books previously. Yeah, no, it doesn't match the one I'm looking at. On my notes either so i agree with you that these are both typos okay good to know mm -hmm. what is this d9 activity one All right. Good finds. Unfortunate on Cogwick's end. All right, so one thing we haven't really talked about yet in a lot of detail is positive and negative density dependence. So this would be what I'm getting at here will relate to number three on the um, topics and learning objectives. So it says contrast negative and positive density dependence and relate each to a pattern of population growth. So essentially it says, you know, define them and give an example of each. So how would we define negative density dependence? Basically, like when the population relies on uh, slower birth rates, because uh, more birth rates would actually hurt the population because resources are running um, running thin. Yes. How how does what would the pattern look like? I guess how does the the, the size of the population relate to growth rate over time? How does that work? Is growth rate high or low when the population is low? Growth rate should be high when the population's low because that means that there's a chance and more resources available. If the population was high, then the growth rate would be lower because there's just not enough resources to go around. Yeah, so we could think of this as kind of almost like that S-curve where the population, or more, be more of a dampening, sorry, not an S-curve, uh, it would be high at the beginning and then it would taper off, right? Because we'd have low population. So it'd be population on the X axis and growth rate on the Y axis and population growth rate would be high initially. And then it would taper off and kind of level out as that population increases. And the reason being, as you said, is because as the population increases, it's the resources become limited. So having a lower growth rate at a high population would stabilize the population. Rather, if the population growth rate continued to climb at a high rate when the 
population numbers were high, it would deplete those resources and lead to a crash. It's kind of like a um, like a cycle, like when there's negative density dependence, eventually the population starts to uh, decrease and then it has to go to positive density dependence. And, and then it's it's an ongoing cycle. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. It could stabilize or it could be um, cyclic. So it could go in either direction depending on the population. So now what is positive density dependence then? Um, that would basically when the growth rate is actually uh, increasing as the population density increases. Yep, and when would this likely to occur? When there is um, more resources, so there's enough resources to actually um, take care of the new offspring, birth rates are higher, and the and the uh, population is actually getting bigger, kind of what's happening with um, with like the human population. Like more and more people are um, growing older and depending on the country, um, the birth rates are pretty much like higher or lower depending. Sure, and one of the one of the key things you said, resources have to stay plentiful. So this, and but generally we tend to see this in small populations to begin with. Because if you have a small population with only a few individuals, it might actually be difficult initially for those individuals to find each other and reproduce. But as the population grows, you have more individuals, so they're more likely to find each other. So the, that way you have both positive. So the population grows and the, the uh, um, uh, reproductive rate grows as well, or the population growth rate also grows. They're both positive. Um, do we usually, what usually happens to positive density dependent populations? Do they always stay positive density dependent? Um, usually what will eventually happen is like sometimes the population will get overpopulated. Yeah, so the flip, right? It can go from positive initially, and then when resources start getting low, it can drop to negative. So they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. And for some, go ahead. Also, like positive dependency, density dependence. Um, it like also tends to prevent like inbreeding and you know like uneven sex ratios. Prevents that because obviously if they can't find each other, they're more likely to have to result to interbreeding, and yeah. there's not males compared to females and vice versa. Yeah, that could definitely be a positive or a, a negative possibility with positive density dependence. Because you're likely going to be in the same area as your siblings because you were birthed in the same area. So we've talked about legs and density dependence a little bit too. And we've talked about the first one, resource availability. That can um, lead to a leg in density dependence. What are two other possible examples that could lead to uh, legs and density dependence besides resources? I think someone mentioned one of them very briefly, but we didn't get into the details. But what also affects population numbers? Immigration and emigration. Yeah, so movement in and out of an area, that could be one. That's an additional one to a couple of that I was from my notes from Cogbooks, but I agree with that. What are two things that could cause a population crash? Like predation or diseases. Yeah, exactly. Those natural are the two cogbooks. Natural disaster is, a, is another one. 
Uh, the, the three examples that Cobb Books really harped on were resource availability, predation levels. So they showed the predator prey cycles a lot. And then they talk about parasite levels, but it could be disease, it could be virus. And I agree with the other examples that natural disaster could cause delayed density dependence as um, as well. So good. Anything goes on the cheat sheet, right? As long as it's just contained to that one sheet of paper. Yep, you can put anything you want on there. I mean, I highly recommend putting the mathematical formulas because you will be responsible for being able to recognize them and do the math as in the activities. But definitions, figures, I mean, you can, as long as it's handwritten as well, anything you want to write on front and back um, is free game. And you're also allowed additional scratch paper, but with those again, it says you know show the show the computer your cheat sheet, to, just to show that it's handwritten, and then show the computer your blank scratch paper. But if you want to do the math, you, you know use the scratch paper to do your math while looking at your cheat sheet. You know that's perfectly acceptable and encouraged as well. I had a question just about like generally the formulas there were a lot of formulas in this chapter um and some mm -hmm. of them weren't really like expanded upon could you maybe give us some guidance on which formulas we should focus on i mean clearly the all the ones in the life table and the matrixes and the growth and the exponential but like for example there was one in t13 about proportion of occupied patches where an example was never shown yeah, I'd say a good rule of thumb would be if there's not an activity that walks through the steps, you won't be expected to do the math. You might be asked some conceptual questions like about doubling time. You might be asked, uh, you know, what is doubling time or how, you know, or something along those lines to describe it briefly or a multiple choice conceptual question, but you won't be expected to calculate doubling time because there's no activities on it. So you didn't have any practice okay. doing it. So like a good rule of thumb would be just be aware of all of the formulas, but yes. you don't necessarily yeah. need to use all of them. Yes, that is true. Um, if you had activities where you did calculations, it'd be expect to be able to do those types of calculations on the exam. Like the two calculations that, you know, I showed an example in that Excel sheet, you're going to see very similar calculations in the exam to those. But again, if you had no activities with them, no, be aware of them, as you said, and know some conceptual questions about them. When are they used? What does it tell us? But you won't be having to calculate them if you didn't have any practice activities with them. Okay. A couple other terms we haven't talked about yet are uh, sink populations versus source populations. So how would we describe them and I guess compare and contrast them a little bit maybe? The source populations are high quality patches of habitat that produce a lot of individuals that are able to disperse to other patches. And then the sinks are the lower quality habitat patches and they mostly rely on the individuals coming from those sources to 
prevent them from going extinct? Sure. So based, I agree with everything you said. Based on that, which population can self-sustain, a source or a sink? A source. Yeah, and a sink population cannot self-sustain as you described, right? It has to have individuals coming in from a source population to potentially maintain that sink population. But if that source population was removed, that sink population would go extinct without the individuals coming into it. All right. Were there any other specific questions or things that we wanted to go over? I was struggling with the demographic uh, stochasticity and the environmental stochasticity. Um, I, I guess I just don't understand how we're attributing a cause to something and then also calling it random. If you could explain that further. Yeah, so which one are they saying is the random events? I mean, I guess events that would be considered environmental, right? Unless you consider, yeah. consider a birth a random event. I think they're getting more at like natural disaster type stuff or like invasive species almost or disease is the way they described it in cog books, right? I guess my so those, problem is I just don't understand how an individual, if an individual, how it wouldn't be considered like um, an adaptation if an in, if a demographic of an individual causes a difference in survival. Because adaptation, if we're going to talk about adaptation, adaptation takes time, right? So if an invasive species for example, comes into a population and brings disease with it, and the host species doesn't have anything to you know, defend itself from that disease, they don't have time to adapt to it. So it could potentially wipe out that uh, host population locally, wherever that new species is present. So I think part of the random event, because the other example they give are natural disasters, is there are things that the organisms can't really prepare for, right? If there's a hurricane or a tornado, an organism can't really adapt or prepare to that. It's going to just happen, hit the population hard, and it doesn't do it at regular intervals because if it was a selection pressure, as you mentioned with adaptation, it would take time and then the population could adapt to it. And with a virus, it, it could, if it doesn't kill them off, say it like just drops the population for you know lower numbers, but the ones that survive build up some sort of antibody or immune system response to it then that, that could be adaptation that it initially was a stochastic event that damaged or lowered that population, but over time, they were able to recover from it. And part of what Cockbooks got into too is they asked about you know, the size of the population what's and this is even a little bit of review from the previous exam you know what type of what size of population would be more vulnerable to a stochastic event a small one yeah a smaller population right because they have fewer individuals less ability to you know respond to that event and um if the death rate is high there's fewer of them to reproduce and recover afterwards so it can lead to more local um extinctions so I get the natural disaster would be an example of an environmental stochasticity. What would be an example of a demographic stochasticity? So that by definition they said is when random variation in birth rates and death rates is due to differences among individuals and not due to changes in the environment. So the environment on the stochastic side, we said, you know, would be the disease, it would be the natural disaster, 
And this is So this is differences among individuals. It's a fair question. I'm not positive offhand what an example would be. Let me look it up real quick. See if I can. Yeah, I struggled with that just because I felt like if it if an individual had like variation in birth rates and death rates, that would technically be like variation in their fitness, right? Which would not generally be considered stochasticity. Yeah, but the stochasticity part is just the variation and demographic is different than environmental then. So I think what they're getting at, as you mentioned, fitness, which would make sense, is that it would be differences like random variation in individual survival rate or reproductive rate. Say for whatever reason, you know, the population got their reproductive rate was 0. 0.6. And then the following year, it got lowered to 0. 0.4, not due to any environmental variation, but due to some physiological change inside the organism. That would be, you know, a change in the individual. And that would create the stochasticity because it's kind of random. It wasn't, it's not like at age one through two, there's zero reproduction. And then at age six, there's zero reproduction, but they reproduce in the middle. It could say like all of a sudden five-year-olds, their reproduction went to zero um, due to some physiological change, not due to the environment. Okay. I think I'm probably just overthinking it. Thank you. Oh, no, it was a good question. So but yeah, the key difference is, is that demographic is a something internal in the individual, not due to the external environment. Okay, to to build on that a little bit, sorry, I was curious about it too because I wasn't real sure. So an example I found here is that it could be uh, genetic drift could be a driver of demographic stochasticity. So say some individuals in the population had a really high reproductive rate and others had a really low reproductive rate. If we had genetic drift where the, it drifted one direction or the other or they, the rant, some event caused those uh, ones with high reproductive rate to disappear from the population, then the population itself would drift towards the low reproductive rate. So that's the stochastic part. And the demographic is just because it's on the individual level of the organisms. Okay, that's helpful. Was there any other, anything else that anybody want to uh, bring up or talk about?
Okay. If not, I think we did a pretty good job tonight. We covered a lot of ground in a good amount of time. Um, I'm also available, obviously, through email still and the support questions through the cogbooks. If anything comes up tonight or tomorrow before the exam yet, um, you can reach me that way. Um, but yeah, no problem. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and participating. You know, I'm sure you, know, you all got something out of it and your classmates that couldn't attend. I'm sure we'll get plenty out of this as well. So I will go ahead and end the session and uh, I get this posted as soon as it as it uploads. All right. Have a good night, everyone.